All right, we got a little vice job that we're going to work on today. This is something that belongs to one of my uh, local viewers named Dennis. And uh, he actually, I believe he said he got this out of the scrap pile from where he works there. It was being thrown away and uh, he had some issues. You know, you can see underneath the bottom of the fixed jaw here, it's busted out. And it had some, uh, this area right here where he's actually welded this up. This was all busted out. So he uh, welded this up with some nickel rod there. And then on this jaw over here, you can see that it's uh, busted out underneath the uh, the dynamic jaw. And then we've got a broken bolt in there. So really all he asked me if I could help him do is to remove this broken bolt here. And then on the uh, fixed jaw, drill and tap this side there where he had actually welded it up. And that's all he uh, wanted me to do. He's going to... Whatever he's going to do, he's going to do it himself as far as cleaning it up and putting it back together. And he's just going to make use of this, uh, of this vice, you know. So it's still, still usable. We just got to get it to where the, uh, the jaws, you can put these original jaws back on there and bolt them back in place. All right. I think what, what I want to do, we, we, I've shown plenty of times being able to uh, get these broken bolts out of here using like a left-hand drill bit. But I think what I'd like to do this time is go ahead and use the TIG weld technique. So we'll go over there and we'll clean this up with a wire brush. And we'll probably just uh, go ahead and do a little bit of TIG welding on here, TIG weld a nut to it. Maybe apply some heat to the, uh, the jaw to help try to loosen it up and see if we can get it to back out that way and, and get it to unscrew. All right, and then that's, that's all we got to do there. So hopefully that'll just uh, come out with, uh, without any kind of really complications there. And then this guy, even though he's done some welding on there, we still got a little bit of cavity right in here where the hole is going to be. So I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and flow some more nickel rod in there with my TIG welder and just go ahead and blend that in and uh, fill that little valley in a little bit more. And then we'll just dress it down with the, uh, with the grinder right there. And then we'll set it up and uh, we'll set it up in the mill and drill and tap our, our new hole in there for the jaw to go back on. All right. Side floor is good there. We're going to come back to this side. better than it did. Maybe that filled that cavity up pretty good, so I think we'll just leave it right there. So by the way, I was using a, uh, this is a nickel rod, nickel uh, 99, just a uh, electrode with the flux busted off of it and then sanded down smooth. And then I am using my new uh, Michael Fuhrer number eight cup there.
I don't think that my other camera captured the welding footage like I tried to get, which is kind of odd. I don't know. It won't play back and it gave me an error. So anyway, I'm trying to get another shot here with my phone just to kind of get a little closer up of the, of the nickel welding here. I'm happy with the way that it flowed in and we'll dress that down with the, uh, with the flap disc there. And hopefully that's going to fill in that void that was there originally for our drilling and tapping. So I'm actually using the, uh, the Furic cups for the first time there. That's the, uh, that's the number eight that I just installed and I've got several of them. The, uh, the number 12 and a couple of the other ones there. I've been kind of playing around with them and excited to have some, some proper cups to, to do our TIG welding with. After I welded it the first time, I noticed there was a little bit of low area right there. So I just uh, just filled it in some more. The nickel's flowing real good. All right, we're gonna work on our broken bolt here. What I'll start with is uh, a washer. We'll weld that on. And then we'll stick this nut on there and uh, weld that on. And maybe that will uh, work there. Let me go ahead and see if I can get a little heat in it. Put a little dab right in the middle of the uh, of the broken bolt, just to kind of start with. That didn't go over too well. That didn't weld very good at all. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna have to regrind that. Let me see what's going on here. Yeah. That's just my luck when I go to try to weld something. I think it's corrosion. I think it's, you know, in the threads, it's really kind of getting to it. Let me just go ahead and see if I can get this uh, washer welded to it. We'll try that. If not, we'll just grind it all off there. I'm not going to worry about grinding this tungsten yet. We'll get some clean metal in there to flow. Some of that heat will get down in those threads and loosen it up some. Not pretty. This isn't my prettiest work. This is actually where a MIG gun works get, uh, really good. Shoot that uh, MIG wire down in there and it flows it really well. I'm just trying to use the TIG welder today. Not in a hurry. Drop the wire. Let's try that and see if it'll come out of there. Nope. 
didn't get enough weld on it. Before we get too far, let's see if this uh, it, it, see if it'll even move. We just might get lucky here. It's acting like it wants to come out of there. So typically whenever you when you come across these like this and you're trying to work it out, it'll be tight. If you'll just keep working it forward and backwards, just going back and forth with it, a lot of times it'll loosen itself up. Well, I think it worked, guys. I don't have to worry about welding another nut to it. There it is. All right. Getting our setup figured out, so I'd show you what we're gonna do. We'll, we'll go to the do-all mill and we'll set this angle plate in there get it clamped in and we should be able to bolt it in there just like that you can see the two holes so that's just working out in my favor and we'll go ahead and we'll use an end mill to go ahead and, and cut this down and kind of hopefully we can get this indicated nice and true to where it's just even with it knock that off drill it and tap it and then that'll be it We've got the, the vice body mounted to the angle plate now and I want to make sure that this face here is uh, indicated nice and square to the uh, axis of the table. So this is a great use for the uh, Sterrett 196 back plunge indicator. Just using the snug and the, uh, the other rod and we're going to use that. It's got a nice wide button indicator tip on it because the surface of this is pitted real bad. So using a test indicator, you'd be jumping all over the place. So this nice, uh, the button there just kind of spans all those little holes and valleys in there. So now you can see um, we're high on this side. All I did was just kind of pull it up in there. So let's see, I don't have it real tight. Keep working it until we get it to zero. Got us pretty close right there within a couple of thousandths, really. We'll go back to this side and tap it again. Looks like I got it right there. So we just need to tighten those those up and then and I'll check it and make sure it didn't move and then we'll go on to our machining there. Really? 
We're going to use this uh, three fluted carbide insert end mill. It uses a triangular uh, TPG insert. So let's see how that works. We already, we already touched off and I fed it up 30 thousandths to see how it does. Alright, that's just touching the the, uh, the original machine face there. I've already touched off on this uh, this back shoulder right there, so we're good there. All right, that was our cleanup cut that you saw. It looks good. We uh, we touched all the way across there. There's more pitting there than on this side, but I think we're going to be good right there. The nickel cleaned up good. So we'll just get lined up on this hole, and I believe I got to double check. I measured the, uh, the jaw. Should be 80 millimeter center to center there, and then we'll get lined up there, offset it, and uh, do our drilling and tapping. And these are uh, tapped 8 millimeter by 1.25. I've got my center right there. That's a, a piece of high speed that's ground to a center point. And I'm going to use that to find the center of this hole right there. So usually what I do on something that's not really critical like this, just come down and grab the edge like that. I'm applying a little bit of down pressure to the quill. And I'm moving the table and just watching it drop all the way until it just touches the other side of the hole right there. So once it touches the other side, I know that I'm there and then I just come up and I visually watch it and make sure that when I come down and hit the hole that it's not pulling to one side or the other and that looks real nice right there that looks real good and then I do the same thing coming the other way so I'll bring the table to me and then hook that back edge bring it down to where it just just touches the front side of the center there and then just keep looking at it and tapping it and making sure that you're not pulling one side or the other and that'll be good right there you've got it I measured the jaw right there and you've got quite a bit of play with the uh, bolts that's going to go through these through holes right there so we should be in the center of that matter of fact what I'll do is take the uh, center out and we're going to use our tap drill I don't have it in there in the center. Okay, well, let's just run it down in there. So, when I go both ways, it drops right down in there and it's not hitting the threads anywhere. So we should be within two, three thousandths, I would say, being in the very center of that hole. So I'm gonna go ahead and zero the DRO and then we'll step her over 80 millimeters. Just want to stick it in here and just visually verify it. That one's lined up and it looks like we're lined up on our little divot there for our center. So should be good. A 
want to use the center there to make sure that we get a good straight hole. I expect there to be some voids down inside the weld. We'll see. I did change my drill bit out just in case I get into the hard stuff. I didn't want to mess up my good split point drill because I can regrind these jobber drills very easy. Using a 1760 force is our tap, tap drill size. And we're going an inch deep. We just went down into a cavity there. to go an inch deep here so I'm just watching the lead out up top I think that's going to be deep enough that was just under an inch all right we got our spring loaded center in there put a little bit of anchor lube there on the tap to Help lubricate it through this and then we're going to hand tap it. Alright, that's feeling like about the bottom so I'm going to stop there. Come on back out. We are just about done. All right, our threads look good in there and that nickel. Just got to do a little cleaning up. Alright, I think we're fixed up and ready to go. So I've got, got some brand new socket head bolts here. Let's go ahead and bolt our jaws on and get this thing finished up. Make sure everything fits anyway. Little tight, little squeaky. That's what it is. It's these, uh, it's the countersink. Look at that. Caught close to those. I didn't check that before I put them in there. Wow. Okay. Didn't even didn't even think to check that. So I guess I'm gonna have to go over there and uh, turn the heads of these bolts down just a little bit so that it'll clear these uh, clear these jaws. So let's go take care of that. All right, we're going to use this 5C collet chuck right here. We're using a 5 16 collet, but it'll hold these bolts there. They're basically the same diameter as a 5 16 even though they're 8 millimeter. And I've got it set so that you can snug up on it like that. Take another five. We'll 
we'll just do all four of them right in a row here. Grab my calipers. Just double check that we got it down to where we want it. It was right at metal to metal. Yeah, we got clearance there, so shouldn't be an issue there. I've had a few guys ask me about this collet chuck, and in case you're wondering, this is made by Kalamazoo. I believe I just saw it in the KBC sales, uh, the, the tool sale catalog. Okay, here's this other jaw. So it should work this time, hopefully. I think we got it. The manufacturer must have used some different diameter uh, heads on those cap screws whenever they built this thing. I'm hoping these are going to be not too long. Let's see. I got them just a little longer than what the one I had in my pocket as a sample. It's going to work. There we go. There we have it. All right, well, this one is done. I'm not going to do any more cleanup or anything on it. That's, that's Dennis's job on this one. This would be a, a great job for uh, if you had like a tank for a tank with a vapor rust to uh, just drop this thing in there and soak it. You know, get all up inside there and clean it up real good. But... Just something that uh, he wanted to save from the scrap pile that was being thrown away because it was broken, you know, in an industrial environment, stuff like this. That's what they do. You throw it away and you buy another one. So he wanted to pull it out of there and try to fix it and take it home and use it on his own workbench at the house. So we were uh, happy to uh, get this done and, and I'll be happy to get it back to him. So there we go. Hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you on the next video, okay? We're over here at Alex's place. You guys might remember him. Hey guys. Alex is uh, the gas tap on YouTube, but uh, we stopped by to visit him for uh, for the evening. And you guys might remember a project that I helped him with. He's uh, been been building the '69 Plymouth Valiant. It is a '69, right? Correct. Yeah. So '69 Plymouth Valiant, and I helped him do the. Um, we narrowed the rear end for this car. So he's been he's been making a lot of good progress on this and he's got a lot of good videos on his channel so be sure to check that out and he's got a lot of uh, future videos coming out on the project that he's going to be doing he's got uh, he's got a lot of cool stuff coming yeah good yeah. surprise coming yeah good surprises coming but anyway i wanted to give you guys a, a little quick update on what he's been doing so he's got the rear end installed in the car so let me see if i can give you a shot here we'll get down here and uh and look underneath the car so he's got everything mounted up now rear end is uh fit in there nicely and i believe everything fit just like just like he wanted he's got new springs he did some modifications to the uh was it the frame or the uh the body you had to you had to move the uh spring relocate kit yeah so he had to move he had to move the springs in a little bit so that he could fit the uh, 275 tires on there disc brake conversion he's got the disc brake conversion kits on there I'm trying to get you in there let me uh, see if i can get you in a little bit further all right there you go so he's got the disc brakes on it and uh, man it's looking real nice everything painted up nice got a new drive shaft just got the drive shaft installed 
Looks like he's still got to put some shocks on it. Not quite done with that yet. He's got a new fuel tank that's going to be going in there. So anyway, that is uh, coming along real nice. Are those uh, Nitto yeah, tires? Yeah, 555. Okay. Drag radial. Same thing's on Big Red. So these are the these are the new rims and tires. I really love the way those look with the black rims. And he's going to be he's going to be getting some uh, caps for it and. Something kind of similar to this right here, maybe, but a yeah, they're a, similar. A Chrysler, so it'll it'll kind of have that look to it. Whenever he gets them ordered, I remember you you showed them on a video, didn't you? Or you, maybe you sent me a picture of them. Yeah, I sent you a picture. They say okay. Plymouth Division on it. Okay, Plymouth so, Division caps. Yeah. So that's I, I think that's a, such a sweet look right there. Of course, you got the the more narrow wheels on the front front end there yeah it's been converted to mid 70s disc brakes so okay. like a 73 to 76 a body disc brake okay yeah so there's the uh there's the there's the engine so this is a magnum 360 this is out of a truck correct yeah yeah it's out of a dodge ram There's still a lot to do to it. He's uh, continuing to, to work on it. He hasn't done anything with the interior yet. He's still got, uh, he hasn't really decided what he's gonna do with the interior as far as, you know, the bench seat or maybe he's gonna put some other seats in there. I'm sure he's got lots to do as far as his controls and gauges. That's the new fuel tank that he's gonna be putting in it right there. But this is a cool car, man. It really is, really is pretty cool. Looking forward to uh, hearing it run and seeing it on the street. So your plan is to leave the original paint like it is, right? Yeah, for quite a while. Um, eventually I will go back through it and, and paint it. But when I do that, I want to strip it completely down. Right, okay. So it'll be, it'll be a little ways down the road because I really want to, the car's been in the garage for about four years and I really want to do some driving and yeah. playing with the car before I paint it. Right. Yeah, let's take a look at the other side too. He's got a little bit of rust down here on the lower lower quarter. And uh, he was showing me this last night. So he's looking into the uh, the trunk. He's already replaced this, right? Is that for the spare tire? Is yeah. that where that goes? Yeah, that was all rusted out. And this plate holds the fuel tank in from underneath okay. these straps. So that was all rotted out. So that had to be replaced to hold the new fuel tank in. Okay. Yeah, got a little bit of rust right there. So he's got some more, he's got a little bit more to do there. Yeah, and found these holes recently. So that rotted through. Yeah. Got to fix that. Right there, got some rot there. And on this corner, you got a little bit of rot right in there and also right about up in there. So there's some metal work that's still got to be done around those areas of the trunk. He said the man that owned this car had it just kind of sitting for 20 years before he had purchased it, right? Yeah, it was sitting, he, he parked the car in 1990. Yeah. He had a guy that wanted the Slant 6 motor out of the car. So he sold the Slant 6 and then the car <laughs> sat until wow. I bought it in 2011. Wow. No, 2000, 15. I bought it in 2015. 15. Yeah. And then uh, he had, I believe he said, a, Tree limb, tree limb had uh, hit the, the windshield and broke it too, but he's actually got a new windshield for it. He purchased already, he's got it inside put away. So there we go. If you wanna see more on the work that Alex has done on this, he's got uh, project videos of doing all the front end, you know, the brakes, installing the engine, installing the rear end, all the modifications he's done. Check out his channel, The Gas Tap. And he's gonna have more videos of all the, all the future updates and projects that he's got in store for this. So uh, what do you think? Maybe another year's worth before this is gonna be on the road uh, driving? We're, <laughs> we're shooting for this December 31st, but. This this year? This December 31st, what we're shooting for. So oh, really? I, I don't know, yeah. I thought you, I thought you were talking about next year. <laughs> no. Oh, okay, so we're, maybe. We wanna start driving it this year. Hopefully. Okay, 
All right, so that won't be too long. Maybe another couple months and we're gonna have this one on the road then. <laughs> Very cool. A tight, tight schedule, but we're trying. All right. Well, anyway, I want to show you guys what the, uh, you know, what the rear end kind of looked like installed in the car. So, very cool. This is the new product that was just unveiled by Evaporus. This is their, this is their new product called Safer Race, and it's for removing paint, uh, paint and varnish. And I haven't used it yet because uh, they they actually unveiled this at the Go to the Land Festival to the entire public there. So I was able to grab a quart container of it, and I'm going to give it a test. I I pulled one of my vices off the shelf. This is that Hartman, and uh, I'm just going to do a little test on it to see how it reacts to this uh, paint that's on there now. So I just want to try it out, but hopefully this is going to be a, a a good product to use for uh, restorations where you're having to remove a lot of paint paint coatings off of the metal and it just may help versus having to uh, traditionally a lot of people have to use wire brushes and things like that so let's try this stuff out I'm gonna put a little bit in this cup here and we're just gonna do a test today just to see how it does so I'll just brush a little bit on here they've got it nice and tacky so that you can apply it to vertical surfaces as well and it's supposed to take uh, about an hour and they did say it depends on the the type of coating and how many layers there are you may have to do it more than once let's just do well we'll use up what we got right here i'm going to leave half of it put it over here too So it is uh, 10 to 11, and we'll give it an hour and see see what it looks like if it just rubs off there and takes the, the paint with it. So, Okay, it's been about an hour and 15 minutes since we uh, brushed the uh, Safer Race on. So this is what it's looking like. It looks like it's um, you know making the coating, the paint coating, kind of bubble up and, and peel off there. So let's just see. First time doing this, I don't know what to uh, what to expect of it. So it's definitely breaking up that surface. Looks like there's a couple different layers of paint on here. The orange I'm assuming may be the primer coat and then maybe their original color was green on this thing and then somebody's painted it blue. Probably uh, use some wire brushes, hand brushes, and just kind of scrub it. And it'll probably knock a lot of that stuff off, especially in those letters there. But it seems like the uh, Safer Race is actually doing its job, though, and working and taking that coating off. May have to put another light coating on there to, to get it this green paint off there. It might have just, just to work down into the, uh, the top coat there. Let's see if this does anything. Well, I think it's working. It's just gonna it's gonna take a lot more work to actually get everything out of there. I, I think maybe going outside with a um, with a hand brush and just brushing it like that, it, it should knock all that paint off there but the original coat I don't think it cut all the way down I think it just started to because you I think it just started getting down in there so may need a second coat I'll uh I'll put another coat on this like we did here and wait another hour and see if it helps break down this uh this original coat of green paint I'm curious to see if it's going to get it all the way down like to the bare metal I went and grabbed one of my wire brushes. Yeah, that's helping, definitely. It's just a dirty job. All righty, we'll come back in an hour and see if we can finish it off. So this is the, after a little over an hour 
of uh, the second coat on the green paint. And you can see that it's, it's taking it off there. Making a big mess of it, I tell you that. Guess it's going to take some uh, trial and error usage of this stuff to uh, figure out the best way to actually use it and then get everything off. It's about got it all though. The brush is just kind of smearing the paint around. So this may not have been a good example <laughs> to show you, but I know there's going to be good applications that this can be used on if you've got a big machine, especially lots of big flat surface surfaces where you can brush this stuff on and then take a paint scraper, you know, and just peel it all off there. But anyway, so that's our first little test with the uh, Safer Race. We'll have to uh, keep experimenting with it and uh, see how it does on some other machines and some other uses and figuring out the best way to actually get everything off there because I'm still seeing some of the, the green on there but definitely taking a lot of that paint off anyway. Well we're back from the good of land fest on our little trip through Texas and I wanted to show you some of the tools that I purchased. Uh, we visit, Me and Andrew and Abby we went to, uh, Andrew took us to a place called Long Machine Tool and there I actually purchased a few tools that you see right here and then I've got a couple that some people give me whenever I was at the uh, at the Good of Land Fest. So I wanted to kind of go over what we picked up and uh, show you what was given to me. We'll start with this tap wrench right here. So this one's unique. This is one that I don't have. So a viewer of mine, his name's Davies from England, uh, sent this over with another viewer that actually traveled over here to the uh, festival. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what his name was, but a uh, real nice guy. Hung out the whole weekend and we got to talk to him quite a bit. But anyway, uh, Dave sent this along with him and wanted me to have it for the collection here at the shop. So this one's uh, unique in that it's LAL is the brand name. It's stamped up there, LAL. And so that was made by Lee, Lee, Lehman Archer and Lane. I'm sorry, Lehman Archer and Lane. And they've been closed up for quite some time, I believe. But it is stamped, made in England. Number four, and it goes from three-quarter to inch and a half taps. And it's in good shape. Nothing wrong with it at all. So thank you very much for that, Dave. Pretty cool that it traveled all the way across the ocean to uh, come to the shop right here. So another gift that was uh, given to me was uh, by uh, Scott. You guys might know him from Essential Craftsman. And he gifted me this hammer right here that uh, he wanted me to have. This is actually made by Brent Bailey. And you can find him on Instagram. Uh, Brent Bailey, I'm trying to remember what his handle is, Brent Bailey Forge, I believe. But anyway, Scott wanted me to have this hammer right here, and it's been pressed in there with his uh, touch mark there, the Essential Craftsman. And it's just a beautifully made hammer, and it feels great. So I'm very lucky to have this. Thank you very much, Scott. Very nice gift to have. We also had uh, another one of my viewers at the festival. I believe he picked this up from Andrew Alexander's uh, tool tool cell there it's a piece of one inch i believe it's rex 95 so nice one inch tool bit it's already got a good radius on there something that we can definitely use in the lathe or the shaper we also had another viewer when i was there uh, bring all this stuff to me and what it is is it's an assortment of carbide inserts and there's more of them in this bag right here as well some carbide inserts and some kind of just miscellaneous type of uh, hardware that you'd find around the shop but a couple of the things in this bag that I wanted to uh, take note of are these snugs right here, these different clamps. So these are some bigger heavy duty that come off some kind of big indicator holder. Not sure what they would have been removed from, but we've got two of them in here. And these might make some nice additions later. There is a, there's an indicator stand that I saw someone on Instagram build. I believe it was Gorilla Fab. And uh, I want to copy his design and uh, kind of make the uh, same indicator stand. And I don't know if I can use these for that or uh, maybe just some other project. But these would be nice to have right here. Nice rigid indicator stands. Maybe something that could be used on the shaper for offsetting the table. 
So anyway, if you were the one to give me all these carbide inserts, I really appreciate that. That was nice of you. All right, so these, these big tool holders right here, I actually bought these from Andrew when I was at his shop, but he had picked these up from Long Machine Tool. These are some of the shaper and planer holders, and I try to pick these up anytime I can because they, they're getting hard to find. This is the size, the number 41 that I cleaned up and give to uh, Lance on his, for his uh, G&E shaper there. So I bought those from Andrew and we were at Long Machine Tool. I, I purchased these other tools right here. So we've got six large tool bits that I found in a box buried over by the wall. So I don't know what grade high speed tools these are, but these would have been used in the lathe or on a planer or a shaper some uh, big tools right there this is probably one that was used in a planter or a shaper but, uh, he uh i asked him what he had to have for him and he said 10 bucks a piece so i paid him 10 bucks a piece for all of these big tool bits right here they're all uh, rectangular in size and i should be able to use these on my shaper or another shaper or another machine later on so that was a good deal on those i spotted a few radius cutters for the horizontal mill picked those up I think I give them like 20 bucks for all those. All right, and then uh, so the big the big tools that I got is uh, he had a whole shelf full of chucks of all different kinds, mostly like four jaw and three jaw chucks. But he did have an assortment of collet chucks, and I saw this guy right here, and I wanted to get it for the lathe because this is a D16 mount right here that that'll fit both the Victor and the Monarch lathe, and so this is for Jacob's Rubber Flex collets. I already have the uh, collets because I've actually got one of these chucks and a while back what I did is for a different mount I actually adapted it to the back to where you could put it in a four jaw chuck and use it that way but this one's nice so that I can mount it directly to the to the lathe and be able to use my rubber, rubber flex collets one of the benefits of the Jacobs rubber flex style is the collets actually the collets have a uh, an expandable range so they're not just fixed to one specific size so they'll they'll bridge the gap between say like a, a quarter and three-eighths of an inch three-eighths a half something like that so you got a wide range so when you got in a shop like mine where I don't necessarily have metric collets for metric sizing you can go to a rubber flex collet like this and normally be able to hold something if you're wanting to hold it in a collet so I had to pay up for this one a little bit more but still a good price, way good price over, uh, over brand new. And uh, so the last thing I got, I bought this challenge angle plate from, uh, from Long. And I, I feel like he gave me a really, really good buy on this. And I thought it would be something that could be uh, well used for certain setups. And it's never been used. What you see right here is from sitting down in the crate with the oil and the plastic wrapped around it all the years that... That it's just been around i don't know how how old it is i don't think it's that old but it was never used and it was always sitting in that box so that is a nice heavy duty angle plate right there and uh i'm just real happy to have it so we may clean it up one day and, and uh maybe even have it as a scraping project in the future but nice nice tool right there so that's it right there. These are the tools that I brought home from Texas and, uh, you know, the good land fest and being able to do a little bit of picking on the road as well. So real happy to have this stuff. Wanted to share it with everybody. So we're going to go ahead and get it put away and uh, move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm.